as the street dance. It's the kids' stuff. But it's taken, now at the eighth year, we had a completely mixed audience from eight to 70 in the performances that are programmed during Urban Connection. And we have, in a regular season, outside the festival, like in the fall season, we do have this fall three established international choreographers from the States, France, and Canada, I think, that all are based on street dance. But they are not presented, I mean, they are presented as contemporary dance. And our regular audience will see that. And the young audience will come to that. Eight years. Yeah, uh, should I? Uh, you be next. Uh, yeah, we have seasonal tickets and we have a crossover of uh, audience in a w in to a certain extent. Uh, how how you uh, define experimental? But I think uh, in in the big theatres you have crossover to to the kind of new theatre, but not into the experimental theatre. I think uh, the the core of their audience don't go there. So it's all, and we have a very small market in, in Reykjavik or Iceland, and uh, the market for experimental theatre is very, very, very small. So, yeah. We have a lot of audience crossing over from different uh, uh, things. I mean, most of our our audiences are get come here to see five different productions. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's uh, the other thing I'm talking about. Uh, we, we are selling a lot of tickets, but it's the same people who buy them. <laughs> so, um, so that's one thing, yes, and we do a lot because it's much easier to get one who, who has already bought the tickets to buy another one. So, but we don't uh, do packages where you have uh, this and this and then you, then you get the unknown kind of thing. Uh, it has been tried out for, for some years ago. Uh, and turned out that, that, that the audience was not really satisfied about that, that solution. So now the package is for prosperity, for instance, is, is uh, your choice, so to speak. Yes, I think we have to go on, uh, so we continue discussing. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, is this a good volume? Or? Uh, my name is Linus Thunström and I'm uh, the CEO and artistic leader of Uppsala Secret Theatre. Uh, right now my head is full of the different discussions, so I will not make a kind of linear presentation. I will try to jump around a little bit in the stream of consciousness and uh, if it doesn't make sense, it maybe will make sense when we, you ask the questions later. Uh, just to give you a little bit of the context I'm working in, uh, we are the city theatre of Uppsala, which means we are the institution in a town. This town is the fourth city of Sweden, uh, which doesn't mean very much, it's a small town on an international level, it's 200,000 inhabitants. Uh, but it's uh, placed very near Stockholm, which gives it a kind of a special position in Sweden. Most people commute from Stockholm to Uppsala every day, it takes 40 minutes only. So there's a kind of a very moving both audience and workplace. Most of the people, including me, are living in Stockholm and going to work in Uppsala. Uh, we are a producing institution uh, which is 60 years old. We have a big nice house, uh, four stages. The main stage has 530 seats, which is quite big for the size of the city. Uh, and we have like staff that does everything from marketing to carpentry to uh, tapisserie to actors, everything is in-house. And I'm thinking a lot right now about giving up power, uh, doing things like that. It's, I'm trying to look with a kind of self-critical eye in a sense. Uh, we are in the middle of a, a big work. I think we have won a lot of victories that are I wouldn't say we have lost any battles, but there are probably a lot of battles we haven't started yet, even. And I think it's a kind of <coughs> balance between this, uh, do you want to be a revolutionary or, uh, or a reformer, a developer? 
I think it's theoretically possible that the institutions could need or at whatever they need or not, but in the future would face some kind of revolution which would uh, uh, totally change the work of the institutions in Sweden, but we're not there yet. And my role, as I define it and from my own temperament, has not been to destroy the institution or to uh, carve it up and make it to something else. I mean, it's been to develop it, to try to move it forward in its own context. Which means that we have these people, we have this city that we are serving, that we're trying to work with. And that brings us to the, let's say, the way I define my work, it's very much about balance. About finding balance between conflicting forces. Because when we think about what should we do uh, in every sense of the word, there will be, just from our employees, from our co-workers, there would be 50 ideas about should we do that type of theatre or that type of theatre or that. And all the stakeholders around us have a lot of ideas. And we are there to serve the communities. We have to balance between all these conflicting forces. I totally agree on everything being said uh, about new public management and the dangers and the force of language, how language forms our way of looking at things. But I do also think, I'm not saying that anyone here has said it, but I, I can feel sometimes in the discourse that when we are saying uh, we have to say no to this kind of economical talk and everything, well, we also have to think about economy. If we don't think about economy, someone else will think about economy. Uh, and it's up to us to take control of both what we do and how we talk about it. Uh, therefore, it is interesting on how you interact with the politicians, how to set an agenda that is sort of using Aikido, taking their words and shifting it around to your own uh, needs. When I came to Uppsala Stadstheater seven years ago, I was... Uh, had no experience from uh, leading a, a big organization. I was I'm a stage director from the beginning, mostly. So it was kind of a new world uh, to conquer the, the situation. One of the first things that someone said to me, a politician said, uh, like an advice to me, Linus, what you, what you do, don't ever whine, don't ever complain, because that puts you off. Uh, I'm just a human being, I get put off by people whining. I do too, so I totally understood that. Uh, so, one of the first things we thought to do is to communicate, to talk a lot. Uh, the old leadership had in a way sort of gotten very satisfied with the idea that the theatre and the cultural value is enough and we don't have to talk so much about it. We can keep the press away because we want to give the artists free space to relax and we, we need to just get on with our work. And I felt this is not really the situation we're living in. We need to find a language. Uh, one of the first things was to read our owners, uh, like the, the directions we're giving in the letter of intent from the city. It says a few things, they're very wide, there's no numbers or anything. It's just uh, like very, we have to develop the cultural life of Uppsala, which is great, why, why not? <laughs> but, but one of these directives is saying uh, we should promote the positive image of Uppsala in order to make it a more attractive place to enhance the visitor's uh, business or industry. And I thought, this is genius. This is so good. This is perfect. Because then I could go up to the politicians and say, okay, you are paying uh, 60 million. You're, in, you're not supporting us. You're investing 60 million. I'm using very consciously the word investing. 60 million in us to enhance the brand of Uppsala. So, of course, it's great if we have a lot of audience, but it's even more important if the things we do are spoken about. If a newspaper, if we make a scandal, it's great. That shows that you have a great self-confidence here in Uppsala, who can support this scandalous institution. Uh, if we make something that's very artistically sharp and is spoken about like this is radical and new, it shows you have a very good self-confidence. Uh, and if we make something very popular and mainstream. So this, I've been hammering in to them. They also said we want to shift Uppsala from being a large, small town to a small, uh, metro small big city. So I said, this is great. We want to be part of that. We want to move Uppsala from being the large, small town to the small, big city. That means we want to have an urban metropolitan theater in this city. And that means we have to be international. We have to be this and this and this. So 
and everyone understands the language of branding about the visitors and all this so this has made them very willing to actually invest a lot of money in us uh, and it, it works there in Uppsala but as everyone's saying there's a lot of traps I mean language is forming you so you have to navigate it but you cannot step out of it because then you are uh, when uh, when I arrived uh, we, we decided to formulate a few guiding words because as we all said language is important so we defined a, a vision like one sentence to guide us and it said uh, Uppsala City Theatre should be Sweden's foremost artistic theatre a new type of local stage with an international outlook uh, foremost whatever that means doesn't mean best it's a little bit saying that we are trying to step into the lead, but artistic, local and international were the key words we were using. Of course, this is only words, it means nothing, it has nothing to do with what we do, but it's a good uh, reminder, because every morning you wake up, you think, shit, how are we going to be foremost, artistic? <laughs> so it sort of pull, makes you pull yourself in the hair a little bit, and everyone else working there. But through stating these things, it has been possible to to push a number of work, and there, I mean, we are in a different situation, this being the, the city theatre, from being, for, say, for example, Schaubühne in Berlin, who can do a kind of one uh, idea, or here in Copenhagen, where you have five theatres sharing different uh, missions, so to speak. We have to be a bit of everything, but I think the point is to get down to, and this word, I'm, I know I've taken it from them, them, the other side, but to find a brand or a voice. So it's not about my personal specific taste, it's about to cater to a lot of people. But whatever we do, if we do very small experimental projects or very big entertainment theatre, it has to speak with one voice. And I think that voice has something to do with a temperament, an attitude, that what we do is sending out energy waves. And then we come to another little uh, things spoken about yesterday. It's not about quantity, it's about quality, people were saying. And I think, yeah, it's true, but it's also about quantity. Because it's something about that we don't sit back and we do one thing and it might work and might not and we wait, but we actually do a lot of things. We, we insist. And I think this insistence gives in itself a vibration of vitality that people see, wow, are they doing that also? That's incredible. That builds upon the attraction to a place. Uh, so, I've been working a bit on quantity, actually. Uh, we started repertory theatre to make more. Now we are in a step of expanding the theatre even more. We went from 60,000 audience to 90,000 audience and, uh, per year, 90,000 people. Uh, and this, now we are, trying, we are uh, expanding the repertoire to, make, to be able to make more commercial with a voice, with a specific type, and to make more experimental on the big stage. If we only make four things, it's difficult. If we make six things, we can have a bigger diversity. Uh, but you have to all the time be aware that that's what you are doing, that the polarization of this. Uh, but one of the things, because we have these actors, we have these resources in the house that we need to put to work uh, to make the most of it, to make... Um, but the real innovative work, where does that happen? Uh, I'm not sure that if you have this structure, this system of a repertoire theatre, that it's really possible to be very radical in your work. You, you will always have some directors coming in who can shift it and make, but you have a, a kind of a working routine. So I think you need to have kind of powerhouses a little bit outside of the theatre too. Uh, we are happy, for example, that we are collaborating with some free the, uh, performance collectives and together with Riksteat and with Bengt we've done, for example, a project called The History of Swedish Democracy. It started with uh, a young woman coming up to me at the Swedish Biennial and pitching an idea to say we want to reach every uh, first voter in Sweden with this project, a lesson in how the democracy has been built in Sweden from a kind of a subversive revolutionary viewpoint. And I said, that sounds great. So they we funded them and they have been working outside the theatre in classrooms and now this project is uh, getting quite big through extra uh, investments coming from uh, private bodies after they made it. So to do that kind of work uh, they, it would not have really been possible in our structure but we can facilitate it. 
we are opening up the space for uh, like homes for treatment for young people being in treatment for self um, um, self inflicting damage um, to tell their stories on stage they came some young girl and said uh, oh, like okay yeah cool you have a theater but you don't you don't dare to tell our stories uh, she said it's only the other people's stories and I said why not tell your stories so we started a project like that very quickly uh, that kind of work, but also on the other hand, to make big events, to collaborate with the big institutions of the city, the big sports hall we brought come together, which is a Danish uh, phenomena, a big theatre concert, uh, like big commercial Cirque du Soleil stuff, uh, which we brought there also. So I think this balancing of efforts while using one voice is what we are work have been working on quite successfully to uh, build different type of audiences and to put the foot down in different holes. Which idea to make us, like, uh, we should be relevant, we should be there everywhere when they think about Uppsala. Now we are going to Almedalen, which is a political, the biggest lobbyist political place in Sweden, where like thousands of people are meeting. We are abroad, we are going to represent the city of Uppsala with the play called My Friend the Fascist, which speaks about uh, uh, right-wing politics. Uh, and we are going to play it there in the middle of the place, which we got the support from the city to do which will make uh, our connection to the city even stronger by the way of uh, putting out a political idea. And uh, now we are sort of best in class. The city, they are like, oh, you are so good, to send the theater forward uh, all the time. And they've raised, we, we cut a lot of our costs. A lot of people said, if you do that, you're going to lose money because they will cut you if they see that you can do more with less. It's been the total opposite. They put more money on us because we have sort of done the dirty work and taken up our sleeves. Uh, so, this is a kind of a spiral we're in, but, just to take, we, we see in a way, we have a growing audience, but it's quite much the white middle class, uh, 55 plus, um, uh, mostly women, so to speak, the, the classical theater audience. And the next step in a way, what, what we need to do, which is hard because we are all white middle class working in the theater as well, so is to find the audience that doesn't come to the theater yet. So we are about to start a kind of audience development project, which I don't know how it's going to work out, but to find the people who don't come and really try to understand why don't they come. Is it because of what we play or who is playing on stage or how we communicate it or is it something else? Uh, and this, this work I think will be the most important. And here you come to this a bit tricky level because the new public management they are measuring who are coming who is this and then we think it's wrong but if we do it ourselves with this great checklist that you said we should think about it it's right so uh, I think we need to speak about audience who are coming who are we telling the stories for whose stories are we putting on our stages and we need to but we need to define our own language, we need to be a bit bolder to set the agenda, to, uh, as you say, wipe out the word support. I've done, I've forbidden people in my theatre to use it. We always say investment or other things, because it's things that uh, fucks with your mind if you think about it. And in a way, come on, we, we in Sweden, we, or in Scandinavia at least, we, to complain it is ridiculous. We have at least, we, we have 85% support from uh, city and, and uh, state. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Even if we cannot do Cigna stuff, the kind of very radical installations which comes 50 people, we can't do that either. But we can do a lot of things. It's, we have great resources, we have great possibility. We live in a time of abundance for culture, I would say, and precedent of possibilities. So we need to use this and uh, like actively work on language and agenda and be quite proud and happy, I think to see the privilege we're having and trying to share that. Well, uh, a bit like this, but I hope there was some sense in it. So, thank you. Yeah, I'm Amsa. Uh, I'm from Iceland, but I solely work on Nordic projects on behalf of all of us. Um, thank you for a really interesting uh, intervention, Linus. Uh, it's really great to hear what you've done with your, your theatre in Uppsala. But my question is, in this 
innovative uh, new approach uh, and, and, and really it seems to me changing and radically changing the image and brand and, and the work you're doing. Did you ever consider uh, embracing contemporary dance as part of your new uh, brand and one voice? And uh, if so, how? If not, um, would you, do you, is it part of a longer term uh, vision for yourself? Uh, no, I never considered embracing contemporary dance. Uh, and it's not part of a long term vision for me either. Uh, I think there is a lot of things. Uh, I mean, all business strategy is about to choose away things, to trade off, to take down, and to do one thing more. I still think we're doing a lot of things, but uh, there is a limit to the number of proposals we can do. And I think in our structures, the place for contemporary dance up. It was getting lower something. Yeah. yeah, the structures to make contemporary dance, it would only be like an extra body outside of us. We are collaborating with dance consulates and we are bringing it in. Yes, we are doing a little bit of presentation of it, but to really work with it would not make sense for us. But we did start an international uh, because it would just be a divestment of the resources for a very small audience for a kind of uh, phenomenon which I think people who are very interested in and burning passionate about it should do better uh, while I'm not. Uh, we, what we did do is we started an international performance festival with performance art which sometimes has connections to art, to theatre, to dance and we ran that for four years uh, until the, fun the separate funding we got from that ran out when we couldn't really sustain it anymore. And there lies kind of a, a heart for me, but mm. this I think needs other people to do. I thought that was very interesting your talk. Um, um, you said that you're, I don't, I don't know your work from before, you said that you're a theatre director and you, 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 you perhaps direct the, still. But, so you came from that job as a theatre director into directing a, a whole theatre as being an executive director. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the autonomy of the arts being in the third, the new publication. Now, can you, so when you came into to, to this job and the approach that you're taking, which seems... Um, some might, some might find it controversial, I think some of the comments might reflect that. Uh, did you sort of feel that your, how did you reflect on your sort of autonomy and your sort of, um, the way that you dealt with that, sort of from a, from a autonomy point of view, if you get my drift? Uh, well, yes and no, it's a very big question. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but uh, I, I First of all, I think the role to be a CEO and artistic leader at the same time, I, I, it's different. In some theatres it's divided into two persons and some theatres it's one person. And I think it's a good thing because this is a struggle that you have to have, a balance. And I think it's good that one, if a person is interested in taking on that challenge, but it's a, it's a balance where you know that every artistic decision I do is economic and every economic decision is uh, artistically strategic. So to know that this in, these things interact then, of course, you have to always think, okay, we do one thing that might be very good for, let's say, the brand, if we speak uh, commercial, or we could say it's good for uh, to build our reputation in the business, that it will attract interesting artists if we do something that is very experimental. This is two ways of seeing it, what stakeholder you're talking to. But if we know we do that, we know that this will probably bring in only 5,000 people on a big stage. It will be a cat catastrophe. But we want to do it because it's important for our brand or for our position in the business. Then we need to balance it with something else, which is maybe a musical or a comedy or something. But hopefully done with a specific edge that you can recognize it's not the same as it would have been done in a commercial theater. So this type of... And then we noticed that uh, Swedish new writing about specific subjects have been quite commercially good. I'm sort of thinking about choosing a way. I've not gone into contemporary dance. I've also not done very much new English, German, Russian, Polish writing at all. We've done mainly Swedish new writing that we have commissioned ourselves. So classical works or stuff that we said, we want to explore this topic 
of the reorganization of the uh, healthcare system, for example, when it was totally incompetent, new public management, they wasted one billion of Swedish crowns. Mm -hmm. So we made a play about this, which was uh, extremely popular because mm -hmm. it was a kind of use, a, a theater not high artistic, but very in the now, totally now, with name given politicians being heckled on stage and uh, very funny and sort of. This type of work has also been quite good uh, audience wise, so to speak. Then it's about trying to find collaborators, trying to work insistently on presenting yourself in different contexts, which will eventually lead to alliances, which will lead to money, which will lead to etc. etc. So I don't know if I answer your question, but. Thank you, thank you. I think we have to okay. go on, so keep your questions for later. Please. <laughs> Okay, I will start talking and you help me to get this presentation on. Um, I'm Ingrid Handlang from Audiences Norway. Um, we work with uh, uh, institutions in, uh, in Norway. We are a member organization. Right now there are 140 uh, big and Less big institutions uh, uh, being our members. They are from theaters, orchestras, museums, uh, culture houses, uh, just programming houses, curating houses, and um, uh, a, a big variety from all of the country, from the north to the south, from different uh, uh, branches. And uh, we are supported by the government, uh, and we are also our incomes, our um, membership fees, and uh, we do projects for members. We also do kind of not consultancy projects, but we well, in a way, we go in and, and, and try to facilitate processes. Uh, for example, in Bergen, where we are uh, based, we do a youth project with different uh, museums and theaters, working together to develop and co-creational space for, for, for young people to, to both uh, actually produce and communicate uh, um, uh, events. Um, are we, is it coming up or? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Good. Um, I was asked to talk about something that we've been doing uh, the last one and a half year and it will end next year. It's called the Performer Project. Uh, the Performer Project uh, is uh, about engaging what we term in this project, and we have a lot of argue about this word since we're talking about languages, uh, we call them non-users. I'll come back to why we use such a word and why we are skipping it now when we are trying to uh, work with the institutions uh, in cooperational uh, uh, aspects. But, I would like to begin with, since, since I was asked to talk about the former project, and last night when we discussed what we were going to do today, I was asked to be, uh, to have an opinion actually, because when, I'm, when I normally work in this field, I, I tend not to have too many opinions. I try to serve our members with insight about audiences. That's what is, uh, that's what's uh, our mission, it is to provide our members with audience insight for them to be able to develop bigger, uh, more diverse and more engaged audience. Good. So, um, uh, this is a challenge because I can't see what I have. Okay. 
Uh, to begin with, I would like to, to just to say why, why bother with audiences at all? Sorry? Okay. Lots of techniques. Okay. Why bother with audiences? Uh, I would like to just take something in the beginning here. There is no theater without audiences. Theater is participatory as such. Uh, we, when we talk about including people in society into the theater, we are talking about, like, we, like uh, now, Dalnisa, cultural literacy. Why should people in society learn to love theater if theater doesn't love people in society? I think that if you uh, don't love your audience or care about your audience, you don't deserve one. Simple as that. As, uh, as I've been an audience, a theater audience, for, uh, for like 30 years, and uh, to me it's quite important to feel that the theater actually wants to communicate with me, that they actually want to give me something. Uh, even if I sometimes get seduced by only really, really great uh, uh, formal stuff, it's still me I still need to feel that somebody really wants to communicate with me, otherwise uh, I don't come back. Uh, and I would just, this is a quote from Hannah Tönfter, who's the head of the National Theatre in, in, uh, in Oslo. And this is something she said when we opened the Performer Project. So it's a quote. <laughs> and it's that theatre without an audience is at best a laboratorium, which is okay. I mean, a laboratorium is fine. You have to do uh, groundbreaking research somewhere. But, at worst, uh, with lots of funding, without really, really interesting uh, interest uh, in in uh, in communicating, maybe it's just masturbation. So you asked me to to have an opinion, and now you have mine. <laughs> um, there is also I also f feel that I work in a in a in a, a, conf a zone of conflicting interests. Um, I used to work as a head of communication at the National Theatre. And now in this role as uh, director of audiences Norway, there is always something attached to me when I, when, to my role when I speak. Like yesterday when I, when I talked to, as uh, some of you were here, uh, I immediately got the role of being the, the, the person that cares only about quantity and not quality. If you're, if you're uh, uh, interested in audience development, you're always a person who are kind of there on some other agenda. You have another agenda. You don't have the artistic agenda. And uh, uh, of course, it's quite offending <laughs> because I really care about quality. But still, it's, all, it's also interesting how this, this role and, and the medium is always the message. If, uh, if an artistic director or an actor talks about the importance of reaching out to audiences, it's fantastic. It's an added value to the, to the artistic uh, profile of the person. But if somebody else talks about it, it's uh, not as suspicious. And I think this is one of the reasons why audience development is so hard in institutions. It's because people in the communication department, they are not really integrated in the business. They are, at least it was like that when I started. Um, when I started as the information, head of information at the National Theatre, my job was to keep the noise away. To be a gatekeeper, to make it possible for people to create art in silence, without all the fuss, uh, from from the outside, and it was even uh, it was even uh, uh, yeah we had situations where when when there came uh, uh, young people to see an Ibsen uh, performance they were actually not welcome because they destroyed the performance so we had to be careful about how many school classes we can have at a time in a room okay um, it's also about um, well, when I talk about audience development, um, the work I do is about changing the institution. It's about working with institutions. So it's not the artistic perspective. I think that's totally different in a way, because when you work, uh, uh, institutions, are like Lina said, they are production machineries. They tend to be uh, self, uh, uh, what's it called? I mean, censored. <coughs> and it's about, there is lots of, uh, technicalities and routines that are important and, 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 that's, uh, and that's, that's the, the objects of, of audiences Norway to, to kind of work with, with those uh, mindsets that are in the institutions because of this. 
And I'm not saying that there is something wrong about it. You need producing, big producing institutions. I'm not suggesting to take them down or anything, but, but there is a need to kind of uh, try to work with the, with the, with the, way, with the mindset. And, uh, and I totally believe that heavily subsidized arts institutions cannot turn their back to society and become self-absorbed. Uh, it's not only because they have a responsibility by getting financed, but because they become maybe not relevant and they will not have an audience. And even if we say that quality is better than quantity, in, like yesterday when it comes to audiences, I've never worked with a director or an actor who doesn't want to have plenty of people to play for. I've never. I mean, they can say so, but that's not the, <laughs> the thing. Um, there is also another thing that I want to point to, and that's the communicator perspective. Um, being between the arts institutions and the audience, it's a strange place to be. Um, as communicators, we also, and I'm not saying that only the people in the communication departments are communicators, because everybody are. I mean, when you program, you communicate. Programming is one of the most powerful ways to communicate, of course. Uh, and when you do really relevant uh, uh, contemporary topics, like you talked about, Linus, that is also a way of, uh, of, of course, it's the best way of attracting an audience's interest. But um, as communicators uh, in the communication departments around in the institutions, we create what I, what I coined uh, inside the <laughs> National Theatre as Forestillingen on Forestillingen. It's hard to, to say in English because I don't even think the word Vorstellungen exists, it's a German word, but it's, uh, it's the, the idea of the play. Uh, but you say it also about the performance, it's called Vorstellungen, so that's why it works better in Norwegian, for those of you who understand it. Anyway, it's, uh, um, it's, um, it's uh, our responsibility as communicator is to, to, to place an idea about what is going to happen. Like Amy said, we sell the performance before it's done. We have to the artistic side have to trust communicators to communicate in that period when they are actually making the piece of art because it's not existing uh, at that point. So you have to communicate an idea about what's going to be. And you need to trust each other to, to be able to do that. If there is no trust inside the organization between those who are actually uh, making this piece of art and those who are presenting it and putting an idea in people's head for them to buy the ticket, if there is no trust, then uh, it's not going to work. Um, the Performer Project is about uh, uh, um, finding out why those people that never come, why it is that they never come. Um, and uh, under that project we did a survey and we applied a British uh, segmentation model. Uh, and this model, I don't have the time to go in details with you at all, it's going to take a couple of hours, but in this model, the whole idea is that you have to communicate differently to different people. That's also an issue, a big issue, uh, inside institutions. You, you, there is always a quarrel inside the institutions, I think, I don't know if you agree, but about how to talk about the arts. Uh, are we allowed to talk about it in different ways or, are we, or do we have to always try to phrase uh, and communicate like the, the, the artistic, the artists and the, and the director communicates about it? That's a problem. Uh, I mean, it's a challenge uh, uh, because I think that if you do, if you, if you, uh, if you become as a communicator, really good in communicating with the directors about the concept of the, the Rishi concept of a, of a, of a classical uh, play, then you are probably, if you, if, you, if you turn around and talk the same language um, when you communicate with a with broad audience, uh, I think that you will put them off. Uh, and, and, and when are you trusted to kind of tweak the, the message? so it can suit other people and is it possible and is it possible to to uh, or even right to talk differently about the same uh, performance the same piece of art uh, to different people 
Is it, can we be pragmatic when we are working with art? Can we be pragmatic in our communication? Uh, is it okay or is it not? Or should the language we use always be an extension of the work itself? Those, uh, those challenges are we grappling with all the time. And uh, it's interesting that I have a couple of minutes left because I have like, I think, 30, no, 22 slides <laughs> up here <laughs> about the Performer Project and the Oslo Atlas. What I can say is that um, the project is about those who, not, who doesn't come. Uh, five big institutions in Oslo participate. It's the National Theatre, uh, the Oslo Philharmonics, the Opera, uh, the Norske Teater, the Norwegian Theatre and the House of Dance. And uh, we did this segmentation analysis that, I, uh, that, uh, that is about trying to divide people in society into eight different groups based on what kind of needs they have, what kind of motivations they have to, to uh, participate in arts, and to create messages uh, that resonates with them as being those types. It's, it's, uh, we, we discuss it all the time, whether it's right to do it this way or not, but still, that's, that's one of the things we did. Um, what we found out about the non-users, was, which was an eye-opener to me, is that it's not like those who don't come to the, uh, to the, to the theatre, it's not like they, they know what's going on there, but there are barriers between them and the theatre. They don't know what goes on there at all. They have, and they have, and most interesting of all, they have no idea of what kind of benefits, to use that language, that you get from attending uh, a performance. They have, uh, they have an idea that uh, it's about a so, it's a social thing, and it's for people not like them. Uh, they have no, uh, they at least they don't express in this survey. Any uh, idea of what kind of emotional impact it has, what kind of intellectual uh, kind of uh, uh, spark it gives, or even, uh, not to speak about the, the kind of spiritual, if you like, or existential kick that you can have by being in the theatre. So I think one of the big challenges we have is that we must stop communicating content in the play, the plot who's playing, we need to start communicate what the experience of being in the theatre is and what it can give. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or opinions? Hi, my name is Gunnar, I come from Iceland. <coughs> uh, I'm just wondering, after listening to all of you, that um, I've been hearing the same speech, the same problems for years, and we are still at the same, you know, same path, uh, talking about the problem of the institution of getting audience, a different audience, but still we have 55 plus women buying the tickets. And our success stories are mostly about getting them to buy more tickets instead of getting new audience. So my question is, in a way, that, uh, for example, we the, we are not talking about like ballet, uh, which is getting 85% of all the money instead of you know, contemporary dance. They don't seem to have a problem. They have accepted that they have special kind of audience. Uh, we are facing uh, in the institutions. It's like, my question is, isn't it the form of the institution in the performing arts that, in a way, we don't seem to succeed to get new audience because we still love the craftsmanship and doing it always the same way, which is not attracting other audiences because we have to do it differently. So my question is, like you said, we need new hearts in the, in the institutions. We need a new way of thinking. Uh, isn't it... We, I, the question is, doesn't we have to realize that the form of the institution in the performing arts is that, if we want to attract a new audience? <laughs> I 
I would just like to comment upon the, the, the so-called fact that people are in theater are uh, uh, 55 plus in women. Um, it's right that uh, lots of women buy the tickets. Uh, they are kind of the cultural ministers of the home, so they buy tickets. But it's not true that that's not the sociodemographics of the people in, uh, in, uh, in the rooms. It's not, actually. So we should stop saying this over and over again, because we reinforce that image. And it's not true. Uh, sometime, if I, if I got the time, I would present the Oslo findings for you. But it's, it's really, really interesting that we are, even ourselves, reinforcing this bad picture of the theatre. We, we should just stop. Uh, yes, I would like to agree there. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, how to say, sloppy to say that. I mean, of course, the audience is not only in this. It's, uh, and during the seven years I've been there, the audience have been, become significantly younger than it was when I started at the theatre. So there is a shift and there is other people coming to the theatre, but I think we could do more. But what we have done so far has made a shift in the audience demographics. Uh, and, of course, we could say... <coughs> that it is dead, but it is highly relevant to a lot of people who actually go there. And I'm not, I, don't, I think it's a great audience we have, it's just that in order to be even more relevant we should also reach other people which we are working on, but that doesn't mean, I mean we could kill the institution and do other things for other people, but then we would deny a kind of a very interested group of audience theatre. I mean I know some directors, uh, Stefan Valmar Holm, when he came to Malmö, he said uh, it's a two-fold uh, job. First you have to scare away the old audience and then you have to build a new one. I've succeeded with the first. He said with a bit of self-irony. And it didn't really work. I mean, I think the point is to not to kill what we're doing, but to expand it and to include more. So I don't, I don't see it as a big problem. Then maybe we see, okay, we can revolution, make revolutions and make other stuff too. But uh, I don't see it as a problem, to be honest. I would say that the art form of contemporary dance is different, uh, but also because it's a question of for us not finding the same audience to all the performances, but defining that it's fine that all audiences are not the right audience for certain performances to be able to justify the width of the available pieces of art to make it really, really wide, and just accept that so 50 people from that side comes to this. And a lot when it comes to performances, that the performance art that we present, our regular audience for those performances actually are users of gallery spaces and contemporary art, photography and the fast moving contemporary art, and they come to see that kind of performances. So, and we have a lot of younger men actually, like almost 40% last year, so that was kind of nice. But it depends on what we program. <laughs> I think institutions are very important, uh, speaking about audience development, because we do have the resources and the continuity uh, to do so. So we can do more than think about this, and that's why it's so important for us to speak about it as well. So, <laughs> and, and by, by the way, it's, it's not true. I mean, as, as it was said before, it's not 55 plus women who buy tickets only. We have 30, one third of our audiences is younger than 25. And, and as said as well, it's, it's lots of people uh, buying tickets is women 55 plus. They do it whether we do sort of communicate to them or not uh, because they're interested in the theatre. But they take people inside as well and it's the network they're in that, that uh, creates the meeting they are interested in the theatre because theatre is not a solo experience, it's, it's, a, it's a, an experience you have together with a lot of people. Uh, so that's also an important thing, that's, uh, it's a social act as well. So, so that's, uh, that's also the reason why it's, it's the same people who are social out in society, who, who are the, the key holders coordinators of the social engagement in this as well. So that's why they buy, buy the tickets as natural. You can't, I mean, it would be ridiculous to avoid them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we will have a... Uh, Sorry, just that, of course, the demographics in certain of the art firms and institutions in Sweden is still like that. 
So you're absolutely right when it comes to the opera and maybe the bigger institutions. It's not, I mean, yeah. We will have a very short break uh, where there is some coffee and water out there. So let's say just five minutes and then we will have 20 minutes. And uh, in these 20 minutes, uh, I would love to hear some good proposals from all of you. Uh, concerning, because we have cut very broadly uh, on this uh, uh, broad and important issue about identity and language. So, uh, yeah, think about how uh, can we give each other uh, good proposals for a future and how can we create the agenda ourselves? How can we uh, decide which way we want to go? So, five minutes, you can bring coffee and stuff here.